Welcome to um, session seven on um, uh, mindfulness. That's going to be the habit. And uh, the sin is uh, mind addiction. And as usual, I'm going to turn it over to Swati for some introductory remarks, and then we'll do the practice and, and so on. All right, over to you, Swati. Uh, okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome you all. And first of all, welcome you, Raj, given that Texas has been so much in the news. Uh, we, I have thought about you very often, obviously, and it's great to see you here. In spite of your three days of no shower experience, you look great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I don't and smell great. I can tell you that. So Zoom, it's good to be on Zoom then. <laughs> yeah, it's good to be on Zoom. In, in person, <laughs> yeah. <I should>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... And uh, welcome to everybody else. So today is our session seven. Some people had asked me, so I just want to remind you, we have one more session left next Saturday. So today is the last habit, but next Saturday we are going to wrap up the whole thing and remind you of the things that you have learned and the things that you can practice after the eight weeks. Uh, so today's session is really uh, uh, close to my heart. Uh, uh, it's about mindfulness. So the sin, as Raj mentioned, is mind addiction. So today we are going to reverse the order a little bit. And I'm going to ask Raj to describe the sin. And I get the honor of describing the happiness habit to you afterwards. So Raj, why don't you take over? Okay, and... uh, very good. Um, one of the reasons why I played the logical song to you guys by Super Tramp uh, is because it's connected to the sin of um, mind addiction. Mind addiction, very simply put, is this tendency to believe that um, you can come up with a better solution to any problem, any situation by just thinking a little more about it. Okay, uh, And if you're convinced of that, um, then uh, you will obviously then try to think through every situation and try to come up with an even better solution. And once you have a solution that's satisfactory, that won't be enough. Um, so you'll want to think of an even better solution and so on. So in a sense, it's uh, related to uh, another tendency that we talked about, I think we talked about in the session on control, uh, the maximizer tendency, which is the tendency to believe that uh, I can, in any situation, find an even better solution. Um, I can change the circumstances uh, to make it even better for myself and so on. So there's no end to it. You're constantly looking to improve every single situation. As you can imagine, that's not a very good, very good, very good uh, tendency, right? Because Oftentimes, what you want to do is just enjoy and uh, not attempt to change the situation. Imagine that you're at a wedding um, and uh, you're seated at a, at a certain table. Uh, you know, you should just enjoy it, right? Enjoy the company of whoever's around you. If you're constantly wondering, you know, maybe I would have had a better time if I were sitting at that table because everyone's laughing there uh, or, you know, um, that I'd be closer to the stage or something like that, then you're going to be a bit of a wet blanket, right? So that's what mind addiction is about. It's constantly thinking and not able to stop your mind from thinking. And the reason why I played that logical song is because the song basically talks about how we are trained to be, be logical, be rational, etc., from a very young age. And so in a sense, it points to the source of mind addiction, which ironically is our schooling, right? I mean, you would expect our schooling to improve our lives, uh, and it does for the most part. But it also um, often worsens our life by, um, yeah, taking us away from the moment, as Gary just mentioned, right? Taking us away from the moment, taking us away from perceiving things as they are. Um, and you might wonder, you know, what's the advantage of that? There's two advantages to um, not thinking through things too deeply and um, being uh, addicted to the mind. And one of those is that uh, actually life is more enjoyable if you just live in the moment. OK, uh, and I'm not just saying this um, and I know that, you know, I'm in a, in a sense kind of preaching to the choir because all of you guys are interested in mindfulness. So you already are aware of this experientially and you probably also know a lot of the research on this. Uh, but there is actually quite a bit of research. So if um, you do not know any of the research, uh, I'll just type out after I finish talking a link to a talk, a TED talk by somebody called Matt Killingsworth uh, on how even if you're going through something negative, Right? Even if you're going through something that's anxiety provoking, it's 
better to be mindful better to focus on whatever is going on right now and be aware of whatever is going on right now rather than distract yourself from that situation okay uh, of course you know uh, you have to practice mindfulness well right i mean in the garb of mindfulness if you're actually not being mindful but you're ruminating about what's going on right now that's going to make it worse right so um but you know if you practice mindfulness well then that's better uh, that's the dominant strategy in any situation in order to be happy so that's one reason why mind addiction is bad that it actually makes it worse for you in terms of the happiness but you might wonder whether it actually gives you um better solutions to problems right and and often that's true right when we think through things we often arrive at better solutions uh, but not always okay um often times our gut instincts our feelings uh, have a lot of information and uh if we are tuned out of them and if you have learned not to um, not to uh uh you know not to experience them and not to listen to them then we often in fact make worse decisions and there is a lot of research on this as well and uh you know it, it's a very interesting area of research because it, you know uh, on the one hand thinking through things can often lead to um good solutions on the other hand uh listening to your gut listening to your feelings and not thinking through things can also lead to good solutions so which one do you focus on um you know is is a big question and the short answer to that question is um it depends right uh, as with many other questions the answer is it depends and part of the it depends um you know is about um what kind of uh, benefit or solution are you looking for if you're looking for a what is called a functional benefit right so what you're looking for is not an emotional benefit let's say that for example that you're looking for a great fertilizer right or you're looking for uh, investing in a home that is um, going to be an investment home okay it's not a home that you want to live in so it's more of a functional monetary benefit you're looking for in those kind of circumstances if you're looking for which stock to invest in it's better to think through it okay it's better to think through it rather than invest in a stock that happens to have a good name or a good logo and you know just like the stock somehow right so those are not very reliable indicators of how well the stock is going to do on the other hand if the emotion if the benefit that you're looking for is an emotional one what we what we call a hedonic benefit like for example uh what kind of a um, house to buy if you want to convert it into a home you want to live in that home right you, you don't necessarily want uh to invest in it or you're looking for a life partner right you want to marry somebody with whom you're going to be comfortable or you're looking for a poster for your uh, office and you want to feel good when you look at the poster it's much better to rely on your gut feelings okay so if you overthink in those circumstances um you're probably going to make a mistake um because your gut already knows what you're going to like and so you go with your gut feel which might be a very very interesting reason why the so called arranged marriages as opposed to love marriages uh succeed so well right um you you go in and you might know about this right i mean in an arranged marriage uh, situation uh you're just you know encountering your potential life partner for a few hours and you have to make a call on whether you want to marry this person or not uh and you might wonder you know how can these marriages survive even after dating somebody a lot <laughs> you often fail um right the marriages fail so how can these uh, so called arranged marriages succeed if you're only meeting somebody for uh, a few hours but it, it they do have a high success rate and there are many reasons for it one of the big reasons could be um that you're relying on your gut in making the decision you know you're very you're quickly kind of assessing can i spend my entire life with this person does this make, person make me comfortable and so on okay so um uh, so i've given you an overview of the sin mind addiction um and i've also talked a little bit about some of the reasons why it is a sin it it uh, lowers our happiness it uh, lowers our quality of decisions uh, it turns out that most of our creative ideas come from listening to our gut listening to our subconscious and um so for a variety of reasons mind addiction is not very good Uh, and with that i'll stop i'm sure there are questions which you can type in and i think elena is here i haven't actually checked but i'm assuming she's here and uh, hi elena we'll over to i can see Mata. her okay hi raj i'm here <laughs> hi yeah good morning okay so i'm going to good turn morning. it over to uh, swati who's going to talk a little bit about yeah. uh, the habit mindfulness yes the habit so raj thank you for the introduction the, about the mind addiction i think one of the things that i believe you're talking about is the idea of self awareness so like you said there are situations when you do want to think rationally you want to think through things 
And there are situations when, in fact, you do want to rely on your gut feelings, but to know when to do what requires some wisdom. Uh, and uh, in a way, that wisdom comes from self-awareness. Like if you learn about yourself, as in how you think, how you feel, how it reflects in your behavior, if you have any patterns on a regular basis, something seems to happen to you, like you get angry and then you have a certain behavior and you distort things for yourself when you get angry and then you react in irrational fashion. Let's say you learn that about yourself or in a relationship, there are similar problems that keep cropping up uh, uh, in your life. Then uh, there is something that is revealing itself to you about how you think or how you behave. And uh, so self-awareness is about that. It's also about being aware of your body because body and mind are connected. And a lot of times what your body is feeling or the sensations in the body are telling you something about your mind. Also it's teaching you how to pay attention to your gut. So I would like to emphasize self-awareness as one of the goals of mindfulness. So mindfulness is about being aware. And I think many of you probably know the definition of mindfulness as moment by moment awareness. So uh, I would actually like to know how many of you think that mindfulness is about moment by moment awareness. If you can say yes, yes, yes in the chat box, that will be really helpful that when you think about uh, mindfulness, you think about awareness of the moment. So I, I am getting flooded with the yes. If you think you don't think of mindfulness as a moment by moment awareness, can you just say no? It could be anything else. Yeah, is it about living in the present moment? If that is the definition of, definition of mindfulness uh, you think about, yes, yeah. so one person said no, and most, and two, okay, two have said no, most have said yes, being in the present moment. Since we have uh, 160, over 160 people, we are gonna get a lot of yeses and a few no. That's what I'm expecting. So I've, I think by now we get an idea of most people think about mindfulness as present moment awareness. And by that, what it means is that don't uh, regret the past, don't think about the future with worry, but pay attention to what's going on in the moment with you. Pay attention to your experience of the moment right now. And is that true? Yes, that part of that definition of mindfulness is true, but mindfulness is much more than that. Mindfulness, the, set, the moment by moment awareness of mindfulness that has become the most popular way, like power of now, that has become the most popular way people know about mindfulness. But the good news is that it's much more than that. If you practice it, you will get much more than a moment by moment awareness. So that's why I would like to emphasize the aspect of mindfulness that is about self-awareness. And when I say self-awareness, that's the other question I have for you. When I say self-awareness, what do you think about? If you can type it in the chat box. What is self-awareness? Being connected, being in touch with emotions and habits of oneself. Yes, awareness of your emotions and reactions to know everything about yourself, being you, awareness of thoughts, emotions, body, environment, emotional intelligence, being conscious of my reactions, being aware of how we are feeling in the moment, awareness of my, it's going so fast that I'm having a hard time. <laughs> but uh, some of them I can see, is think about yourself consciously, Yes, yes to all the things that are being said. Self-awareness is when you know that this is going on, what is going on in your mind, your reactions, your choices, and aware that subconscious, yeah. So self-awareness is all of these things, awareness of what's going on in your body, your mind, your feelings, your reactions, your patterns, what are your values, 
what do you believe in how you behave in certain ways how you uh, how you affect the world and the last one is saying self care listening to what that little voice that intuition or gut feeling yes knowing about that also knowing about that little voice in you so to know about yourself okay now my next question is is it always pleasant self awareness is it always pleasant no 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 mixed yeah so it is not pleasant yes because we all want to feel good feeling good is an addiction when uh, raj says mind addiction one of the things i don't think he means that or maybe he does but it is addiction to feeling good and always wanting to pursue what feels good and move away from pain anything that's slightly unpleasant or painful we don't want that typically we have aversion to it right so that's how we are made go more towards pleasant experiences and immediately move away from unpleasant experiences so that's the addiction we have however what if we decided to be courageous and learn to observe ourselves instead of getting sucked into the unpleasantness what if we learn to observe ourselves what if we learn to learn about ourselves knowing that it's going to lead us to a more stronger and a better decision maker in some sense in life what if you knew that and what if you decided to learn about yourself more for that with that in mind even when it is unpleasant so that is mindfulness so mindfulness is watching yourself without judgment without having this uh, resistance so completely accepting whatever is coming to you in the moment instead of running away from it without holding big judgments and you learn to observe yourself with curiosity so the observe part is important so observe is not the same as getting sucked into the emotion so think about when you are stressed out about something let's do this little exercise if you are stressed out about something if you get sucked into it what happens you feel it in your body you feel maybe your heart racing your head aching or whatever ways in which your body expresses it and your mind starts making a lot of stories when i say stories i don't mean they're all wrong but uh, some of them may even be right but uh, regardless our mind is making up a lot of scenarios like let's say you are uh, working on a project and you are really stressed out so what is what's your mind making up at that time whatever situation that makes you stressed out think about it and think about what thoughts come to your mind so if it is about a project it came it could be that i'm not uh, i may not be able to finish it on time or it's so overwhelming to have to you know put in so many hours and i'm so tired i just can't do it and if i don't do it i'm going to fail or you know maybe i'll get fired i mean wherever uh, depending upon your anxiety habits your mind can go anywhere if you have pain in the body depending upon who you, what your pattern is you could take yourself to the hospital and die in a few seconds in your thinking and right now covid is uh, still on people's mind and so that fear has become even more pronounced that our mind starts making up all kinds of stories when i say stories again i want to emphasize not all of them are just false but just know that we get a lot of thoughts and it takes us to a places that are not always real so to know our pattern of thinking to know how our mind works helps us you uh, some of you may remember uh, the story of the farmer the maybe yes maybe not maybe good maybe bad uh, the farmer who has a, so i i don't want to repeat that story again 
because some of you may already know that is really well. I'm going to turn my phone ring off. Okay, so it's like that. When you are experiencing stress, now I'm going to ask you to do this. Okay, first of all, just stay quietly and pay attention to your body and you will be experiencing the stress in the body in some way. And just relax your body first. Know that whatever uh, stress hormones, whatever cortisone that is getting released, you don't want it to affect your body. So if it is like you feeling pressure or you're feeling tenseness anywhere, if you can just relax your body, that's number one thing. Re learning to relax the body in the moment. And then if possible, whatever is stressing you out, if you can remove yourself from the situation and the, just observe. So this is a little bit, I mean, this is an awareness game, okay? You are not, uh, you know, like splitting yourself or anything like that. You're just, as if you're watching someone else a little bit, this body that's sitting here, this is the moment of stress. And this is how this body is experiencing the stress. What if you did that? This is the moment of stress. This is not forever. Also know that this is not forever. Right now in the moment, this body is experiencing it like this. But this is not forever. This is impermanent. And I'm just observing it. And main thing, relax your body as you're observing it. And if, there, if your mind is getting flooded with thoughts, just recognize that's how it is right now. Whatever thoughts are coming to your mind, they are not, they are real because they are coming to you, but they, are, they don't always hold the truth. They don't know what is going to happen. So you are learning to essentially just not get sucked into the stress and believe in getting sucked into the stress is to believe in all the stories, all the thoughts and feelings that coming to us as if it's the truth. So this is a habit. And this is what you are developing, this habit when you are practicing what's called mindfulness. The ability to observe yourself without judgment, with acceptance and simply observing. That includes the present moment, obviously. That's the most important thing we have. So when you are experiencing or paying attention to the present moment, you are not just saying, oh, now I notice the flowers and those are great. Or now I notice my body and there is pain here. That's not the only thing we are doing. What we are learning is not to run away from the pain or the body, whatever it is, and not pay attention to it. or because it feels good, okay, let me drink some more. Not that. The ability to know how to stay with the pain and then it makes sense to you. So if there is pain, for example, if you have chronic pain, then instead of going all the way in your mind to the hospital and dying, if that's what's coming to your mind, what if you notice, okay, that's what is coming to my mind right now. That's how I'm thinking. Uh, maybe yes, maybe not. I don't know. But most importantly, let me relax my body and let me think about or let, let, me, let, me, uh, let me allow myself to just notice what's happening. In that process, you may get some kind of an insight, like why you're feeling so stressed out. Maybe you know a friend whose mother or parent or somebody passed away because of COVID and maybe that's why you are feeling so anxious. So to know that and then, then you may get insight that my story and their story is different. Or you may think about what is it that I can do for uh, socially isolating myself or to make sense of the isolation and make use of it. So some kind of insight may come to you because of knowing 
what goes on with you and because of the ability to stay e with yourself even when it is difficult swati may i make a couple of uh, quick comments yeah okay so uh, one thing that i found very useful is to um, recognize the distinction between what um, the researchers called uh, call mind awareness and what they call bare awareness um so when you become aware you know and people say you know it's moment to moment awareness i think some people uh, have the confusion of you know, what exactly does it mean to be aware and uh, to me i mean i found it very useful to recognize that awareness can come in at least these two varieties mind awareness is when you're aware of a situation and you're commenting on it you know right now i'm feeling stressed for example and stress has these um characteristics my uh, palms feel a little cold and and uh, damp my heart races a little bit skips a beat and so on that's mind awareness that's a commentary of what's going on bare awareness is directly getting in touch with these sensations without coming up with labels okay and that's a very difficult thing to do because as we learned our education system is is based on mind awareness it's based on judging commenting categorizing labeling and so on and so that's become so automatic that we don't exist in what might be called the precognition stage before the cognition before thinking kicks in there is something going on and to connect with it directly is what bear awareness is and the attempt is bear awareness so in the example that swati gave about you know feeling stressed out and recognizing that maybe because of covid etc that's still a thought okay but if you don't have the thought you just are connecting to the experience directly then it's just another experience okay in, in that from that lens it doesn't matter if it's a negative experience or a positive experience it's just an experience the label of negative positive is a label of the mind so here's another analogy that i've found useful which is you know in any experience you have two knobs at least two knobs that you can turn up or down one of the knobs is the knob of um the feelings okay whether it's positive or negative right and you can focus on that this feeling is pleasant this feeling is unpleasant etc and you can dial it up or down the other knob is the curiosity knob okay just getting directly in touch with what was going on and being curious about what's going on without being scared of it right without necessarily being greedy for it just just curiosity as a scientist would be as an observer as a disinterested unbiased observer would be and so the idea is to dial up the curiosity knob and dial down the feelings knob if you can do it and if you can do that then i think that would make you settle into observing things as they are going on moment to moment without any judgment without any commentary i mean it's easier said than done obviously but that is the idea one last comment i'll make and then you know back to swati um is that i have discovered for myself and i don't know if any of you guys can uh, relate to this but when i tune into my bodily sensations even in moments of intense negativity and the you know negativity might be driven by my mind by fear by sadness whatever but it has a set of physiological reactions it produces a set of physiological reactions that i'm able to tune into without the commentary of the mind or at least not with a lot of commentary of the mind where the com the mind commentary mind awareness has been tamped down quite a bit then i feel that my body just automatically relaxes okay so you might actually be tense and the tension is showing up in a certain part of the body maybe your back but if you're able to get in touch with the sensations of that pain of that you know tension of that stiffness then just focusing on that part of the body tends to relax that part of the body that's what i've discovered for myself so in a way you can start with your body being totally relaxed and get into a mindful state or you can become mindful that is be bare bare aware right not barely aware but bare awareness and then that body that body part starts to starts to relax automatically okay so i thought i'd uh, make those comments and over to you swati again yeah so uh, uh, yeah i'm glad you made the distinction because bare awareness is how mindfulness begins that's how it begins as in mindfulness is to learn to notice the experience with these characteristics i have also put it in the chat curiosity non judgment acceptance and simply observing 
So you are not judging it. And when Raj says mind awareness includes uh, maybe, you know, knowing that this is good, bad or whatever it is. So if you are becoming aware mindfully, then you will be also aware of, okay, I'm judging. I'm judging it. I'm uh, deciding if it is good or bad. So you observe that also. Sometimes you will be able to dilute the judgment just because of observing. You may not express the judgment because you are learning to observe. Sometimes it still may not be possible, but you observe that also. You accept whatever is coming to you without getting, you know, like angry about it or why me or I don't like it. How can I push it away? Or this is so great that I want to keep it all to myself all the time. Even that. Uh, you are not doing as much because you realize that everything is moving on, everything is constantly changing and be okay with that. That's life. So I will enjoy the experience while it is on. So one of the Buddhist teacher, he, uh, I remember him saying that he was holding a cup and he said, it's a beautiful cup. And if I start thinking about, oh my God, I have to be so careful about this cup. It may fall and it may break and it may chip and all these kinds of things. Then we are not, I'm not enjoying the moment right now. So enjoy the cup, the beauty of the cup or whatever drink is coming to you through the cup right now. And uh, maybe in the future, it won't be there. Maybe it will break, but to be okay with it. So uh, somebody says, we. Pasana. So yes, so Vipassana is uh, about mindfulness. Mindfulness is in fact uh, a word that has uh, become, okay, I should say that it begins with Vipassana, but then it's more a Western version of Vipassana. It is uh, slightly diluted, but also more made into a more like a psychology, psychological tool that people can practice because Vipassana can be very, very rigorous and it can be very hard for most people. But mindfulness is possible for a lot of people to practice and still get most of the benefits because we are still householders. We are not expected, expecting ourselves to be monks. So uh, that's what mindfulness is about. What I, I suggest is let's do this. I'm going to lead you through a mindfulness meditation. So before I do this, one thing I would want to say, I would uh, like to point out is meditations, mindfulness meditations is the fastest route to develop the habit of being mindful. With attention, you pay attention to the moment with the characteristics that I told you about. Meditation is the fastest route. That's not the only way to become mindful. You can also do different activities mindfully and train yourself to be mindful. And what the advantages that come to you, we'll talk about that later. First, let's do this meditation, a basic mindfulness meditation, where I'm going to guide you through paying attention to first your breath, then your body, and then your feelings and, and your thoughts, okay? So it's going to be like a fast version of what mindfulness uh, meditations you would be doing. In typical meditations, you would be only focusing on breath for whatever amount of time you have decided, or you would be focusing only on body sensations or only on feelings for a long amount of times. But right now I'm going to walk you through all these three different things at the same, I mean, one after the other in the same meditation. Okay, so uh, let's close our eyes. And relaxing the shoulders. And take in a few deep breaths. And with each deep breath, noticing the energy and the nourishment that the breath brings to us. And 
and then allowing the breath to become normal. Whatever ways in which your body wants to breathe right now, just allowing the body to breathe just normally. And now, if you wish, you can place your hand on your heart area. And noticing how each breath is received by the body by paying attention to the slight rising and falling of the chest. If, you if your hand is on the heart area, you can experience it more. Even without it, you can still pay attention to the breath coming in, the chest rising a little bit, and then breath leaving the body, and then chest falling down. This is how my body is receiving the breath at the moment. I have this moment. It's me and my body sitting here and noticing me. Noticing the facts, the reality of me. This is how my body is receiving the breath at the moment. And this reality exists with everybody who's sitting here in this group, in this world, breathing, universal fact. This is how the breath is coming in, in my body, and then a rest when breath goes out and then comes back again. Chest rising and chest falling. And if the mind wanders around, that's okay. That's the nature of the mind. Once you realize that your mind was somewhere else, saying to yourself, aha, this is my mindful moment. I know my mind was somewhere else. And let me bring it back to my breath. Noticing how my body is receiving the breath. Everything else is outside this door. You are cultivating the habit of being able to focus, focus on one thing. And at this moment, it's your breath. Breath is always with us, no matter where we are, as long as we are alive. And that's the reality of the moment right now. This is how my breath is coming in. Maybe it is shallow. Maybe it is long. Maybe it is peaceful. Maybe it is irregular. Whatever it is, simply observing. Not trying to change it. And maybe if possible, noticing with curiosity, the breath that comes in at the moment, this moment, Maybe it's slightly different than the last moment. It's changing, changing how your body feels constantly.
Maybe suddenly your body decides to take a long breath and sigh. Maybe it suddenly becomes shallow. You don't know where it is going to go, but you're learning about it. And now as you breathe in, paying attention to the body, first noticing the entire body. This is a container. This container has its top, the top of your head and the bottom is bottom of your feet. And noticing the entire container and see what you notice. Where does your attention go first? Maybe the tummy area, maybe the heart, maybe the head, maybe the back, maybe the knees, maybe the feet. What do you notice first? Whatever you notice, allow the attention to stay there. Notice what temperature you feel in that part of the body. Noticing what muscle movement, if any, that you feel in that part of the body. Is there any movement? Is there any sensation on the skin? in that part of the body. Is there any aches or pain or pressure in that part of the body? It may be pleasant, may be unpleasant, may be neutral, but you're staying there and just simply noticing, simply observing with curiosity what's going on in that part of the body. This is your body, this is what you have, this is real. And what's the reality of that part of the body at this moment? Learning. If the mind wanders around, that's okay. It may wander around thousand times, bringing it back thousand times to whatever you are currently doing, which is to pay attention to that body part. With curiosity, not judging. If the judgment comes, simply noticing, ah, that's what I'm feeling right now. Simply observing and accepting whatever is there. That's the way it is at this moment. And now, as you're paying attention to your body, maybe there are some feelings and thoughts that are coming to your mind, noticing the feelings and the thoughts. Let's begin with the thoughts. The thoughts may be about that body part and whatever is coming to you, or maybe not. Maybe the thoughts are about planning for the day or if it is nighttime, then 
thinking about the next day, making to-do lists, or maybe thinking about some incident that happened or some stressful event that you're expecting, just simply noticing what thoughts are coming to your mind at the moment. Are they related to this body part or not? Noticing that first. Being curious about what thoughts are coming to you and watching how thoughts could be random, could be related, could be a stream or a lot of times, maybe different kinds of thoughts crowding our mind, depending upon your habit, the habit of our mind. What kind of thoughts do I get? I'm getting right now at this moment. not judging them. Some thoughts may be negative. Some thoughts may make you feel I should not be thinking like that. But noticing even that, that I'm thinking I should not be thinking like that. Or this is not a good thought. Simply noticing, not pushing any thought away, but just becoming aware of the thoughts. Good, bad, ugly, all kinds of thoughts. And what are the feelings that are accompanying these thoughts? Are you feeling confused? Maybe lots of different feelings. Is it possible to just pay attention to the feelings? Maybe excited, maybe happy, maybe relaxed, maybe anxious, maybe angry, maybe fearful. Feelings typically can be described in a word or two words. And thoughts are long and have big sentences that associated with it. Knowing that feelings and thoughts are two different things. What am I feeling right now? If the mind is wandering around, bringing the mind back to checking the state of the mind for feelings. And then noticing are these pleasant feelings, unpleasant feelings or neutral feelings? Even anger could be pleasant for some, unpleasant for some or neutral. So whatever feelings you're feeling overall, the state of your mind, the state of your feelings, is it pleasant, unpleasant or neutral? Paying attention to that with curiosity. If it is unpleasant, that's okay. We can stay there and pay attention to how that feels, the unpleasantness. If it is pleasant, wonderful. It's easier to stay with that. And if it is neutral, simply observing pleasant, unpleasant or neutral. And once we notice if it is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Now going back to the body, 
and noticing if the pleasantness, unpleasantness, or neutral feelings can be experienced in the body anywhere. Is it expressed in the body anywhere? Just checking. And now breathing in and breathing out, going back to the breath, paying attention to the breath. Taking a few deep breaths to get ready to leave this meditation. Breathing in deep, nourishing the body, noticing the nourishment, the energy. And slowly getting ready to leave this meditation. And now opening the eyes slightly first and then all the way. I don't have my gong here. I'm in another place today. But take my words as the gong that you can open your eyes. So I imagine uh, that some of you were probably wandering around a lot. Some of you were coming back from time to time. Some of you were able to focus more. Some of you may be falling asleep. Some of you may be awake. Uh, regardless, whatever happens, that's the way it is. And you get a glimpse into how you learn about yourself. So let's go with all the questions. And then during the questions, then some of the benefits and thoughts can be expressed. So uh, Elena, what do you have for us? <laughs> Well, we haven't really got any questions, actually any questions. So guys, please get active with okay. the questions. Uh, maybe at the beginning, okay. there was uh, one question. Uh, when Raj was talking about bear um, awareness and uh, types of awareness and then in general about um, how to observe our feelings and emotions, they, there was this uh, question from uh, Mega, what if health gets affected? Um, maybe there's like a risk or maybe I also like was thinking when you Raj talked about bear awareness and you said you connect with them you you don't really label them but you feel them what does that mean exactly is there any risk that you might uh, your health might, might get might be affected if you tap into those feelings and states and emotions if they're negative so uh, what I mean by that is, um, I think, difficult to describe in words because it's an experience that I'm talking about. But basically, I, I'll try and explain it in words and hopefully try to be a little bit clearer. But um, at any moment in time, there are bodily sensations that are going on, right? I mean, your heart is beating. Um, there are electrical impulses being sent from one part of your brain to another part. Um, there is you know, twitches in different parts of the body. There's a little bit of an itch somewhere and so on and so forth. And generally speaking, hang on just a minute. Let me mute somebody who's unmuted themselves. Okay. Um, generally speaking, we are aware of what might be called gross sensations. These are big sensations, you know, particularly sensations of pain, um, chronic pain. We are very aware of it. Um, we know how it feels, whether it's throbbing, whether it's sharp, um, whether it's dull and so on. Um, but we generally tend not to be very good at being aware of what might be called subtle sensations, un unless we actually practice it to some extent. And the idea is to get in touch with those subtle sensations and they're going on all the time all around the body. 
And many of those sensations don't even have a label, right? I mean, these um, labels that I use some time back, like an itch or a pressure or you know, heat, cold, etc. Many of the sensations don't even really have a label. Um, so, for example, right now in the in the session that we just had, I closed my eyes and I got in touch with my sensations, and I had this feeling that there was an ant crawling up this part of my face. Okay, and I, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, obviously that really isn't an ant. It felt like there was an ant crawling up, but it wasn't an ant. And once I started focusing into it, the whole place was full of ants. Okay, and, and they were all crawling up um, on the side of my face. And then slowly it kind of spread over to the side of the face. And maybe these are just electrical impulses being sent out on my skin, but that's how the, the sensation felt like. But the commentary of the mind is suggesting that it is like ants crawling up, but really there is a sensation, there's an experience that is happening even without that label. And getting in touch with that sensation is what I'm talking about. And if you are able to purely get in touch with that sensation, you even lose the concept of a face. It's just a bunch of sensations, vibrating cells all, all over your body. Uh, and you know, at some level, what happens then my experience has been is that there is a sense of merging with the external environment and that doesn't even seem to be a boundary of the body. There's just a bunch of um, perceptions or sensations going on and um, that's all it reduces to. Anyway, so I don't know if that helped clarify or maybe made it even more confusing. So the second part of your question was about, you know, whether it's harmful for you. Uh, there's a lot of research on this. Um, so if you're hypochondriacal, then you know you tend to focus on different body sensations. You might feel like um, th there is you know lots of negative things that are happening, and that might make you feel stressed out, which might make it more difficult to be um, bare, you know, to exercise bare awareness. It might get you into mind awareness and rumination and negative thoughts. Uh, but if you continue to practice it. Uh, you know, just will your mind, in a sense, to uh, pay bad attention, then you overcome that phase of mind attention, and you're able to do it. So I am not aware of any studies that show that mindfulness can lead to, say, death uh, through a heart attack or anything like that. Okay, uh, I'm not aware of it. Doesn't mean that it can't happen. I don't think it happens. Uh, but, you know, who knows? Uh, but all these studies that I'm aware of, there has never been a study that showed that people sat down to do a meditation session and then they got so stressed out that they just, you know, fainted or something like that. Okay. So um, yeah, it, it's not physically dangerous, um, but there is a difference between being um, truly mindful that is paying bad attention and thinking that you've done a mindfulness session by paying mind attention. And if you do mind attention, then you're going to walk out of, out of it, out of the session thinking, what's the big deal? You know, I just got more stressed out. I just, I thought I paid attention to things and I was aware of what's going on, but actually it's making me feel worse. And if that is what is happening at the end of it, then chances are that you did not pay better attention. You weren't mindful. Thank so I, I, yeah, Elena, I would like to just say a couple of things uh, that, yes, so mindfulness, like if they, there is a hypochondriac who's paying attention to the body and getting over overwhelmed. So that, is possible or if you are depressed and if you are paying attention to your negative feelings and getting further depressed uh, so that is possible so that's why i think mindfulness it's a good idea uh, to do it with some teacher in the beginning because then you can uh, kind of keep track of if it is not exactly helpful to you but in most cases like raj said if you still push yourself like if you are hypochondriac and you keep pushing yourself or keep challenging yourself, you may overcome that fear. But that takes a lot of practice and a long, it's a very long process. So just be mindful that if, in case if you start feeling more stressed out or worse because of practicing mindfulness, that can happen to people because you're opening up yourself to paying attention to the things that you're hiding from you. So in that sense, yes, in fact, it may feel worse because suddenly you're paying attention to those things. But just bear with it. Bear attention, but <coughs> also bear with it. <coughs> and look for different ways. So talk to a teacher and look for different ways in which you can still become more and more self-aware. 
Elena, you had something else, I think. Um, I'm going to um, ask you two questions and maybe you can uh, redistribute them and decide which one is going to take which. Well, there, there is one about from Nikhil about the influence of mindfulness on identity and ego. Yeah. And the second one is uh, how do we practice mindfulness uh, if we need to, if we are in a very tense or charged situation and we need to act or intervene? Yeah. Um, yeah. So how do you practice? Do you first practice mindfulness and then you act? Or do you first act and then you practice mindfulness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great questions. Really great questions. So the first one is about ego and identity. And uh, the question is, you know, will it change? Your perception, uh, I would assume, does change. That's the one of the things that you want to actually do. First of all, by ego, I assume what you mean is your pride or your sense of, you know, like who I am. And uh, uh, most mindfulness practitioners, and again, that has been quite well established, that when you practice mindfulness, first of all, you realize the universality of your feelings and emotions and your existence, right? So this uh, goes back to one of the habits that we, uh, since that we had talked about, the wanting to be superior or wanting to be special that need goes down because of realizing that even when whatever you are experiencing accomplishments or pride or whatever, that's not a permanent thing. And that's, there are a lot, and you get more and more in touch with the reality. See, mindfulness is about experiencing what's real. What are the facts as opposed to everything that's get, getting created in our mind, making ourselves look bigger to the world or to ourselves or whatever it is that we do. So it is about learning about the reality. So yes, the ego will change. And I find the way it changes for most people is that they will not have the same kind of pride. And the identity, first of all, a Buddha who came up with mindfulness believed, Buddhism believes that identity is not like one fixed thing. You must have realized that your identity or who you thought you were changes when you were, when you are a teenager, when you are a, a young adult versus when you, are, when you grow older. So just be aware of it to be open to getting different perspectives and learning about things when that happens, then you're open to, you know, some of your beliefs also may change. And it's not bad. Sometimes you may feel restless. Okay, I think this is who I am. It's not true. It's not about that. So at the moment, I feel this is who I am. This is what I believe in and that's wonderful. I'll act accordingly, but be open to that changing because you will be learning more and more about your own patterns and changing them. So the ego and identity does change. Um, sometimes people worry about, okay, I may not experience stress as much because I understand that that's impermanent too, and I can relax my body and I can learn about my stories. But if I reduce the negative feelings, will that reduce the positive feelings as well? So I find the positive feelings themselves don't get reduced. But if you are feeling like, I am so great, I'm so wonderful, I'm so accomplished, that may actually become a little bit more real. Yeah, this is great, I achieved this, you know, wonderful, but not making it like ballooning it into something too big. So that could happen. The second question, Elena, was about reaction, like first react and they, then be mindful, or first be mindful, or then react, right? Okay, so one of the things that mindfulness uh, does is non-reactivity. So once you're observing whatever is going on, you don't take action right away, which is good because that gives you some control, internal control, like we talked about internal control. So when you are being mindful, what you're doing is, let's say you get angry and you yell, but if you are being mindful, you just watch your anger. You don't yell right away. You just let that anger stay there and observe the anger before doing whatever it is that you do. Maybe then you have more control over not yelling, but talking peacefully, or maybe talking with more control in your voice and communicating better. So non-reactivity gives you a choice of how you want to modify your actions 
into something effective. So mindfulness encourages non-reactivity or cultivates non-reactivity. You first observe. That's what mindfulness is about before reacting. However, okay, there are situations when you need to react immediately without thinking, like it's a flight and fight kind of reaction that we have when we experience some threat, like especially physical threat, right? Or even emotional threat. If you are into flight and fight, you will react immediately. That will happen to you. Even after we practice mindfulness for many years, there are something basic. There is something that comes from our reptile brain which is hard to change unless you are a monk and they show monks, you know, sitting and everything is going on. Sometimes, you know, big floods are coming, a monk is sitting and gets uh, washed away in the floods. But for most of us, that won't happen. We don't lose our fight and flight response. They may mo modify themselves. So every time you see a snake and you jump and you are like, oh my God, and run away, I mean, I'm saying every time you see a snake, as if, you know, people are seeing snakes all the time. That's not what it is. But when you see a snake, let's say that your habit is uh, you're phobic, you are like afraid and you literally like jump and run away. Instead, if you become mindful, then you maybe you will realize that the snake is not like a tiger that's going to jump at you if you peacefully move away then maybe the snake will go away on its own. And this is something that comes to you because of not reacting right away. <clears throat> but if the snake, if you, let's say by mistakes, jump on the snake, you will do whatever is necessary for you to, you know, take care of your, your own uh, survival. The survival instincts don't go away. Does that explain it? Whoever asked that question, I don't know who asked that question. Yes, I, I think so. So it makes okay. complete sense. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, but yeah. So uh, the non-reactivity, uh, just one uh, second, um, Elena. The non-reactivity versus the immediate fight and flight response, that when this happens versus that happens, that equation changes because of being more and more aware. Um, you, uh, you know, the serenity prayer, I think we mentioned it that, uh, you know, give me courage to accept whatever comes to you and fight it whenever it is possible. And then the last part is give me wisdom to know when to do what. So by practicing mindfulness, in a way, you're leading to more wisdom of when to practice what more naturally. Thank you, okay, Sorry. Yeah. And there is a question from Kevin. Um, he wonders if there are specific alarm thoughts that we should wonder if they are helpful or not maybe there are some thoughts that appear and we should uh they're like uh you know some kind of signs that we should not be thinking them we should not feel like this and when we spot these maybe we can stop some feelings from becoming from developing from becoming negative yeah so what's the question there is that like a comment or like a comment yeah, uh, if so there are, you, there are some, some kind of thoughts like that uh, by which you can identify that something worse is coming to you, that you're, you're, you're not supposed to develop those thoughts, you're not supposed to pay attention to those, to, to those thoughts and yeah. you, you uh, block them or, or de detach from them. You are saying, are you, yeah, I, I take, uh, let me understand this question. Uh, I think what, uh, who, who asked this? Kevin, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so Kevin, I think what you mean is that you know that they are going to spiral down. And so as a result, do you how you can stop it before it spirals down? That 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 is true. You do want that. Yeah, you do want that. Yeah. So the the thing about that is if you are afraid of them, then and if you're pushing them away, what you resist persists. So just by consciously deciding that I'm not going to think about it doesn't mean they stop. They still keep coming. But if you have a way to, at that time, okay, you're learning about yourself. This becomes too overwhelming for me. That spirals me down. If you know that, okay, mindfully, I want to divert my attention to something else that's positive with that intention. That is possible. And in fact, even in Buddhism, there are ways. I mean, you may know about loving, kindness, compassion, meditations. 
gratitude, forgiveness. So all these kinds of things that actually make us move more towards positivity, you can intentionally do that if you know that you are spiraling down. But first, you have to know all these things. If you just resist, then it persists. Pay attention to it. That, that's what happens to me. We are afraid of things coming to us because we think about how bad I'm going to feel, how awful I'm going to feel, and we don't want to feel that. So that's why mindfulness is about, okay, even if I'm feeling really awful, to know that this is not going to be forever, this is how I'm feeling right now, this is life that reduces the intensity and then you are not as afraid. It kind of gets you ready for everything. <laughs> well, there's that one more question uh, from Alberto. I think it's an interesting one. So what about the images? So sometimes when we meditate, yeah, it, we see some images. So what about the images that come to your mind unintentionally? Um, are we supposed to pay attention to those images? Maybe they are trying to unconsciously are trying to tell us something or are we supposed to go back to our, uh, to, to our breath? That's a good question too. Yeah, I would say that, yes, you do pay attention to the images. If, let's say, okay, so uh, mindfulness has two steps. Okay, first step is to focus on one thing. That is typically what we practice in the beginning. And then we move on to paying attention to whatever is going on in our mind. So single pointed attention first, and then getting into general more awareness, open awareness. So if you have decided that the single pointed awareness for next five minutes, I'm going to pay attention to my breath. If that's what you have planned in your meditation, then you would just, if the images start coming, yeah, okay, these images are coming to me, but then you go back to the breath. So you are cultivating focus by doing that. If you have decided I'm going to pay attention to body sensations for next 10 minutes, then you pay attention to body sensations, images come to your mind, thoughts, feelings, you just notice, okay, that's what's happening, back to body sensations. Then if you have decided, okay, I'm going to just check the state of my mind, what's going on in my mind right now, not single pointed awareness, but generally, generally the state of my mind, then you pay attention, okay, these are the images you make note of what the images are, what feelings they are generating, what thoughts, wherever your attention is going, you become aware of the attention itself. So there are two styles. <clears throat> I think it's uh, it's particularly um, good to pay attention to the images if they're recurrent. Then if you see them every other meditation, then there's probably some message for you. <laughs> yeah, maybe yes, maybe not. <laughs> So yeah, so the, that's why that's why I'm saying that it depends on what meditation, what, what your stage of meditation you are and what you have decided. So if so, certain images keep coming to you outside the meditation, you can think about them. But if you have decided to do a breath awareness meditation, then uh, that's what you're paying attention to. Not letting those images, not letting your mind to get consumed into analyzing the images during your meditation. You come back to the breath. All right, do we have time for one more question? Sure, yeah, let's just do one more and then we'll end. All right, so there is one from Jose. Uh, does mindfulness help uh, building confidence and assertiveness in your communication? Um, and does it also help you to tackle life decisions and life as a whole? <laughs> Everything you said, Jose, that's the wish, right? That's the aspiration. That's the aspiration that it, because, I mean, I, I'm very tempted to say, yes, it will make you feel confident and assertive and all that. I'm very tempted to say that. And the, it, but, uh, but the reason I am not saying that right now is, yes, it is an aspiration. And if you do it with that intention, then it will probably happen to you. Basically, mindfulness, as I said, when you are becoming more self-aware and when you are accepting yourself the way you are, it will give you confidence. You accept even your imperfections. It's not such a big deal. And that's what will give you the confidence. And assertiveness, because you accept 
when you are not doing things right and when you are doing things right and more and more confident you become about that then you would become more assertive of whatever you think is right or whatever you think is your need at that moment hello and and decision making also that is something that is uh, okay all these things are established in research uh, the decision making because you are making your decision not in a very highly stressed out and uh, highly fear some i mean uh, sucked into fear kind of a state of mind but uh, you will take more perspective you uh, you will naturally your gut itself getting in touch with the gut that rash talks about that improves when you are being more and more aware and as a result your decision also may improve so what one thing that i'll add here is um that all of the things that we've discussed thus far will make you more confident not in a kind of a fake way that you know you are you express <clears throat> confidence to other people you're kind of getting up on stage and starting to sing or whatever but a quiet confidence and the reason is because uh, if you practice all of these things that we have talked about you will naturally end up not comparing yourself to other people that much um and i think that is the root cause for lack of confidence uh is wanting to be like other people wanting praise from other people and so on and so if you look at pursuing flow as opposed to pursuing superiority if you look at gaining internal control versus wanting to control the external environment if you look at having an implicit trust in people and a trust in life and so on everything is going to settle you down into being happy with yourself and happy with the moment but there's a paradox there just because you're happy with yourself and happy with the moment doesn't mean that you'll not want to change things right so it'll be this kind of coexistence of contentment in the moment and with yourself with the energy to want to change things for better uh and so there's a bidirectional kind of a relationship between those habits and mindfulness you'll be able to practice mindfulness more easily you'll be able to settle down into the moment more easily observe your breath more easily etc if you practice <clears> those <throat> things which is why in buddhism you know they have this kind of uh eightfold path right so you have to practice not lying and not stealing and not uh consuming too much alcohol and so on and so forth in order for you to be able to prepare your mind to settle into mindfulness and if you are able to do mindfulness then it will also feed into uh reinforcing these habits so again i mean you know it won't be the kind of confidence that we typically associate with the word confidence like trump right? just to mention a random name hello um, hello <laughs> but uh rather the <laughs> confidence which um also allows for you to praise other people so it's not a conference where it's a comparison with other people conference hello. but a celebration of diversity hello kind of. hello so i uh, raj with that i think it is a good uh, way to end our session with uh, so just remember quiet confidence uh, yes because of self awareness so with that uh, we will see you all next time thank you elena for parsing the questions and i hope everybody and those of you who want any answers you can always email us if anything you want to know about mindfulness training or anything like that you can always email us so um thank you everybody raj is there anything you want to say or shall we leave no that's <laughs> it i i was just uh, typing a farewell message to everyone and that message okay. is right now okay so take care again everybody have a wonderful and week stay ahead and stay warm stay warm, warm yeah. raj i hope everything yes. comes back to normal really soon yeah, sending you compassion yes <laughs> bye thank you